Because September is National Suicide Prevention Month, um, in light of that, we wanted to talk about it. Um, and due to the nature of the topic, tonight's service will be um, deeply informative, first of all. You'll, you're probably going to learn a lot. Um, but it may also be deeply emotional. And so I want to say that more as maybe a trigger warning, but rather than shy away from the conversation, we really want to engage in the conversation because this is one of the things that we're seeing increase and, and raise, especially in the U.S. Um, and in Western religious traditions in particular, sometimes we have a tendency to not talk about it or to even demonize it. Um, so here we want to take a, a kind of a totally different approach and, and really engage in the conversation and learn more about it. Um, and, and not get into theological discussions about it, but more or less, what can we do? What can we do? What are the signs? What can we do? How can we help? And while my own life has been impacted um, in various ways by suicide, rather than pretend I'm an expert, um, I'm not going to. And so I've asked uh, Wendy, who is a trained um, specialist, if you will, among many things, to, to share some insights with us tonight on, on what we can do, how can we help this um, disease or epidemic that has affected so many. And before we jump into this evening's discussion, I want to, because I think this will help pivot where we're going tonight, especially with Wendy's story, um, let's take a moment to watch a five-minute video. And this video is actually a, a couple clips that we made um, that's an excerpt from a short film called Families Are Forever. And Wendy and her family were featured in this film along with their story of their son, Jordan. But due to the nature of the film, it's I think 20 plus minutes long, we condensed it just so you could get the highlight of what's going on um, to get a backstory of Wendy's family, Wendy's life, and we'll go forward with that. But if you wanna go ahead and play the, the clip at this time. I had a plan set up in my head that when I went, when I finished college, I was gonna move somewhere that my parents wouldn't be able to find me so they wouldn't have to be hurt by knowing their son was gay. I was about 11 or 12 when I realized that I was gay. Maybe I didn't know what the word exactly meant, but I knew I was different from everyone else. He was the happiest, most exuberant child. He would be excited when the trash truck would come. Mom, can I go watch him dump the trash into the truck? And, and the mailman, and he's like, look, he's putting mail. I mean, everything was exciting. And I loved that about him because the things I took for granted, he made me see beauty where I didn't notice it. And he saw it everywhere. In the church, we do baby's blessings, where the father gives the blessing to the child in front of the whole congregation. Even from those very early moments, you know, you have set expectations within your own mind of what you see your child growing up to be. Mormon boys always have a plan. Mormon girls do too, but especially a Mormon boy really has kind of his life laid out for him. Boys that he had been friends with his whole life, he started to not hang out with quite as much. We put it together that he was pulling away from any Mormon friends. But then we also noticed that this boy who never stopped smiling and was the happiest kid around was not so much that way anymore. I was very depressed. I kind of pulled away from all the members of my family. I was mortified of the idea of being disowned by my parents. I was like, I do not want to be thrown out of my home and t my parents telling me, I hate you, you're awful. How did, how did you choose this? How did you go through with it? Tom was sitting across from us and he says, Jordan, I need to ask you a question. Jordan said, okay, dad. And he said, are you struggling with feelings of homosexuality? And I could feel him start to tremble. And, and he kind of nodded. And we sat that way for two hours. And I just, I just hugged him. And at one point, I took his face and I held his, his, his cheeks in my hand. And I made him look right at me. And I said, I love you. This changes nothing. My mom's dad was a different issue. He told her that this isn't right, This he shouldn't be doing this. It was a very awful experience for me to overhear this. It was very hard on me because my 
grandpa had loved me so much and I and I adored him. He was he was one of my favorite people. And to hear that from him was devastating for me. When um, we would see our bishop or our stake president, and they would say things like, well, you know, we can get him the proper therapy and they can help him, and, and this can probably be taken care of. He's just confused. Um, he's not really gay. Don't put that label on him. Don't you dare label your son. We ended up seeing eight different therapists we first went to um, an LDS therapist who worked for the church, and he um, he was very much wanted to change me. He wanted to reverse what I was, make me straight, but but that wasn't going to happen, and that made things worse for me. We could see him being depressed and being sad. And when he saw this big question mark looking into his future and it, the plan wasn't laid out and the things that he thought brought happiness were all of a sudden not available to him. He talked several times about suicide. He's like, what's the point of my life? We have lots of pills because we have a big family. I was thinking I would just like get all the pills, take them all at once and die right then. When he said, there's just no point to my life. What, what's the point? Mom, just let me go. I can't tell you what that does to a mother's heart to hear that. I want to make sure that he can get to adulthood and not have made huge mistakes that compromise his health and his happiness. And there's a lot of landmines along that road. Figuring all of that out is not easy. But if you take your family support away, I don't know how you do it as a kid. I need to fill him with purpose. Uh, you know, show him this is not the end of the world, this is the beginning of your world. And how you're going to live that and the things that you're gonna do are gonna be magnificent. I never had the chance to meet Jordan. He's a wonderful human being, wonderful human being. I wanna give you just a quick uh, bio on Wendy before she gets up here. Wendy Montgomery was born and raised in Southern California. She and her husband, Tom, who's with her tonight, were married in 1995, and they have five children. One of them we obviously saw is Jordan. Wendy is one of the founders of Mama Dragons, which she may tell us a little bit about, maybe, and, is curr and currently serves on its board of directors. She is also on the board of directors of Affirmation, Mormon LGBTQ Family and Friends. Wendy has been doing suicide awareness and prevention work since 2013 and is trained and certified by both the Trevor Project and QPR. Wendy is a vocal advocate for inclusion and equality for all LGBTQ Mormons who feel on the outside looking in. From quiet, unremarkable lives of routine and religion to activism and national leadership, Wendy has been speaking out, not only in defense of her son, but in support and love of all LGBTQ people. Wendy is a voracious, I love that word, reader, Apparently you are a voracious leader. Uh, loves history and is doing everything she knows how to make the LDS church more welcoming and inclusive of its gay members. She is currently attending college, pursuing a degree in nonprofit management, and she and her family live in Chandler, Arizona. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Wendy Montgomery. So I was telling Angie before, um, this started that my worst nightmare is crying in front of people and she promised me I'd have a box of tissues up here <laughs> and they're not here. <laughs> That'd be really bad if I have to use my sleeve, Angie. Someone needs to find me tissues. Um, thank you guys for being here. Was that obvious enough? Thank you. Thank you guys for being here. Um, I'm actually surprised to see so many people this is an incredibly tough um, and uncomfortable topic. And the fact that I'm having this in a church is kind of blowing me away. So thank you 
for addressing this issue and for asking me to speak on this. Um, and I wanted to just also talk a little bit about what Angie said about a trigger warning. If at any point anything I'm saying feels traumatic or painful or it's hitting too close to home, please feel free to step out. I promise you won't hurt my feelings. I'm more worried about your emotional well-being than I am that you're here to hear this. Um, this is a difficult topic. Um, and I also wanted to address in the graphic the semicolon. I had several people ask me about my shirt. For those that are not familiar with the semicolon project, it was founded by a woman that had struggled with suicide herself, and unfortunately we lost her to suicide. But the beautiful metaphor of the semicolon, for those of you that are writers or, or voracious readers like myself, um, a semicolon is used when you can end a sentence and use a period, but choose not to. So it's the metaphor of keep going. Don't use a period, use a semicolon. So I just feel like that's an important thing to, to talk about and mention um, for this month for suicide prevention. Um, I, as you saw a little bit of the clips of that documentary on my family, which is it's really hard to sit and watch that because I'm reliving painful moments. Um, but I came to the suicide prevention and awareness work because it hit so close to home with my son. Around the age of 12, this bright, bubbly, vivacious child that some of you that have met Jordan, you've met him, like he lights up a room. He has always been that way. But around the age of 12, that light just went off. He went from being an A student to an F student. He changed over all of his friends from these good, wholesome Mormon kids to um, kids that were getting in trouble a lot. He wasn't eating and sleeping well. He just shut down. And I, <laughs> I have never felt fear or panic in my life like I did then. I hid knives. I hid pills. I slept on the floor of his room. I was afraid to leave him alone. I was afraid to send him to school. So that's a little bit about why this matters so much to me, is because anyone I know or learn about that might be suicidal, they feel like my son. And they immediately become family to me. Um, and I know that Jordan's not alone in these desperate feelings. And it's really important that I do whatever I can so that nobody else feels that way, and so that no other parent or child or sibling or friend ever, ever feels that type of helplessness that I felt then. But this extends far outside of me. This, I imagine that most people sitting here have either known somebody that's taken their life, it's hit close to home, you may even have your own stories of battling this beast. It has taken some of our most beloved from us, and it has damn near taken so many others. Um, can we put up the first slide? Is that okay? This is Stockton. That's my daughter with him in the first picture, and he has his arm around my son in the bottom um, right picture. He was my son's best friend. He was his first kiss. His parents are some of our closest friends. He took his life on June 27, 2016. We go to the next slide. That's my son in the black in the front. That's the Paul Bear for his best friend. This was two years ago, and I still can't see that picture without just waves of grief. 17-year-olds should not be burying 17-year-olds. If you've seen the documentary Believer on HBO with Dan Reynolds, the um, lead singer of Imagine Dragons, you saw George and Allison, Stockton's parents, telling their story. That was an act of courage and bravery and vulnerability like I have never seen. Can we go to the next slide? This is my friend Berta Marquez. She's, she's a deep 
close personal friend of mine. That's her wife in the picture on the right that's six feet tall. Berta and Kathy were the ones that we would call in Utah when we heard of a kid that got kicked out of their home for coming out to their parents. Berta ran the youth track of our affirmation conferences, so um, my older three kids that would attend those conferences knew her very well. She was a Guatemalan refugee. Her story is fascinating. It would make an excellent movie. Berta took her life June 26th of 2018, less than three months ago. She would have been 40 on August 31st, like three years younger than me. You think you get the teenagers past scary time. There is no end of the scary time. It can, this can hit anybody at any age. There are so many pictures and so many stories I could tell you of people that I've lost. And I'm sure everyone out there has stories like this of people that you've lost. This affects so many. Suicide hits all of us. So why the stigma? Why the taboo? Why can't we talk about this? Why is this unique that I'm talking about this in a church? Of all places, this should be where it's talked about. If we are not here for each other, then what's the point? We can't help others until we get over our own fears and discomfort and insecurities about this subject, because our silence is serving no one. Now, I just wanted to take a second and address um, my own privilege in this space. Um, why me of any person should even be up here talking as far as privilege goes, with the exception of being a man, I am at the top of that food chain. I'm white, I'm straight, I'm cisgender, I'm middle income, I'm able-bodied, all these things. So as I have come to recognize my own privilege and wrestle with the guilt that I have, that I have so many things that have just been handed to me that I have not earned, that I'm not worthy of, it feels more and more important that people that have this privilege that I have, that we stand up almost as a shield to the more marginalized and discriminated against, that we let the waves break on us so that the waters are calmer for them. That's our job. We're given so much, so we need to amplify their voices. We need to hold them up to our level of privilege and make things safer for them. So with all that I've been given, I'm doing whatever I know how to make life safer for my son. For so many, like Stockton and Berta. Okay. Stop crying. We gotta get through this. <laughs> So we're, I'm going to go through a few statistics, um, some myths, some common misperceptions. This might be, no, it's easier to see on that one, I think. Um, the reason that I'm using a suicide statistic from Utah is obviously I do a lot of work in Utah with the Mormon LGBT population. And also, this translates not exactly but close to other conservative religious communities, which Arizona fits in there. Right now, Queen Creek is having a rash of suicides. Arizona is not far behind. The purple line is the national rate of suicide. The yellow line is Utah's rate of suicide. And these numbers only go to 2015, because suicide numbers are always two years behind. And that's a whole conversation about why that is that we'll go more into detail when we actually provide the training for those of you that are interested. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, but it's important to know also that these are not my numbers. They're not affirmations numbers. They're not one church's numbers. These are the CDC's numbers, which is the Center for Disease Control. This is a neutral government agency that's collecting this data. So it's not biased. There's no agenda behind it. I'm not trying to be sensationalist. This is reality. Um, let's see. So some national statistics that I feel like are important to share 
is the most current research shows that 43% of lesbian, gay, or bisexual students seriously consider attempting suicide, compared to 15% of straight students. 30% of lesbian, gay, bisexual students report a suicide attempt, compared to only 6.4% of straight students. Trans students report a more than 46% attempt rate. That is almost half. We have got to talk about this. These are people we love. These are our friends and our families and our coworkers. So I want to address um, some common myths and misperceptions when it comes to suicide. Myth. No one can stop a suicide. It's inevitable. Fact. If people in a crisis get the help they need, they will probably never be suicidal again. That should give all of us hope. Suicide is the most preventable cause of death. We can help. Myth. Confronting a person about suicide will only make them angry and increase the risk of suicide. Actually, the opposite is true. Fact. Asking someone directly about suicidal intent lowers anxiety, opens up communication, and lowers the risk of an impulsive act. You're not putting the idea in their heads. If you're thinking somebody might be suicidal, there's a really good chance that that thought is already in their head, and they will feel immense relief when you ask them. If they're not suicidal and you're way off base and you ask them, they'll be like, no, I'm good. No harm done. But if they are and you ask, they're so grateful. Sometimes they just don't have the courage to say it. Myth. Only experts can prevent suicide. Fact. Suicide prevention is everybody's business, and anyone can help prevent the tragedy of suicide. We go to the next slide. Myth. Suicidal people keep their plans to themselves. Fact, most suicidal people communicate their intent sometime during the week preceding their attempt. If we're paying attention, they are giving us lots of clues. They're giving us verbal clues, whether very direct, very indirect. They could say things um, along the lines of, I just don't want to wake up in the morning. Life is too hard. Uh, Will you take care of my dog? Here's my favorite guitar. Those are big red flags. There's behavioral clues. They're telling you. Myth, those who talk about suicide don't do it. Fact, people who talk about suicide may try or even complete an act of self-destruction. Now, I'm not a fan of self-destruction. I'm not sure why they use that word, but that's true. By the time somebody is talking about suicide, they're closer to attempting than you may think. So pay attention to those clues. Myth, once a person decides to complete suicide, There is nothing anyone can do to stop them. Fact, suicide is the most preventable kind of death, and almost any positive action may save a life. Now, we're not asking you to be first responders. We're not even giving that kind of a training. All we're doing is helping you know how to intervene and get them to the professionals, because that's not us. So how can I help? Ask the question. So the QPR training that we're offering in a couple weeks. Um, QPR stands for Question, Persuade, and Refer. The question is, you ask, are you feeling suicidal? Are you ever thinking of harming yourself? Do you have thoughts of wanting to take your life? You are that blunt. And if you're not able to get the words out and ask, find somebody that can. It's really important. It's very intentional that QPR sounds so much like CPR. Just as CPR training enables trained citizens to save lives from heart attacks, QPR enables trained citizens to save the lives of people contemplating suicide. Now, one thing I wanted to mention is this is not just an LGBTQ phenomenon. This is an important thing. I mean, that's where my... um, That's where my radar goes, and that's where my work primarily has been. But this affects all of us, male, female, gay, straight, black, white, and anything in between that doesn't, that you don't fit into a binary box or label. This is for all of us. Um, So when you are 
when you go through the training of QPR and um, you're taught the steps, this is a really like hopeful and positive type of training. And you, the most important thing is that you're giving the person that you think could be suicidal, you're giving them hope. We have probably all been in a place where we know how it feels to not have hope and how dark that spot is. Nobody should live there. It's hard enough to even visit. So more than any other thing, research has found, and I'm sure all of our own personal experience has shown, that hope is a powerful thing. Hope is the thing that can reduce the risk of suicide. So this is part of why Angie asked me to speak on this topic today, and I'm really grateful that she did. Um, To speak to the seriousness of this issue, but also to offer hope that this is not a foregone conclusion that somebody might be suicidal and you're going to lose them. No, you can actually save them. Is there anything in this world more precious than a human life? There's not. There is nothing that is more important than helping people we love stay alive. I'm sure everyone here has lost someone for a multitude of reasons. It didn't have to be suicide. And the grief that comes with that, it's gut-wrenching. If you knew you could do something to help, to keep them alive, wouldn't we do anything, anything? It's so important. Be the light that other, people's need, that other people need. I'm really grateful to be here, to be able to talk on this subject in a church of all places. I know I just said that, but it's still blowing me away a little bit. Um, thank you for hanging with me through... Uh, a really tough and triggering um, conversation. This is hard. Uh, we'll talk more about um, signing up for the, the QPR training, what that looks like. It's about an hour, 60, 70 minutes, and you leave trained in what QPR calls the gatekeeper program. You will leave with every resource you need. You will know how to recognize suicidal behavior. Uh, you will know how to intervene. And you will have local and national resources. So when and if it comes into your life that you are with somebody that might be suicidal, you will know exactly what to do. There will be no fear. Because you'll be like, I got this. I'm here. I can help you. It's a very empowering place to be. So thank you. And we'll open it up for questions and answers. Question, answer, if you have any. Also, if my husband wants to come up and help with the Q&A, because he's got really great stuff to say, too. Right. Okay, so for our live stream, our people watching live stream, the question was, any tips for people posting stuff like that on Facebook? Like maybe su- suicide ideation? Okay, so thoughts of suicide, how, how to handle that? Um, I would, if you know this person, get them on the phone. If they live locally, drive to their house. Every... Even if it's the kind of thing where you think, oh my gosh, they post stuff like this all the time and they're just crying wolf, you take every single one of these seriously because you never know. By the time they're posting things like this, like it's rare. It's probably like in the 5% where somebody's just doing it for attention, and that's what we want to say for our own comfort a lot of times so we don't have to deal with it. It's like, oh, they're just looking for attention. Like I had people say that to me when I told them my son was suicidal, like people close to me. Um, because that feels easier. But if you know this, I mean, I know sometimes with Facebook friends, we don't always like know them well, or if you know where they live and you're local, go. If you know where they live and you're not local, but know people that are, call those people. Just get somebody at their door. And worst case scenario, you can always call 911 or call 1-800-SUICIDE. The Trevor Project has phone numbers and say, we've got this going on. Should I, and you can, ask for you know tips on what you can do but I, the best thing is you just get a live body with that person that's the best thing you can do and sometimes it's hard when it's a social media thing but right qpr also offers a youth um training which is really important that i i wish they would implement this in all of the schools because so often a kid will tell their friend you know i just I really don't want to live anymore, but please don't tell anybody. And then that kid thinks they're being a good friend by not telling anybody. Now, the best friend you could be is to tell. Like, tell the parents, a teacher, administration. Like, because now that child that lost their friend and knew is going to, for the rest of their life, wonder if I could have said something or done something. Like, the kids need to know the best friend you can be is to tell somebody. 
And a lot of times these teenagers, they're not equipped. They don't really know what to do, but they can tell their mom. They can tell um, a teacher, or a principal. They can tell somebody. But it's tragic when you hear that. One, one of the things that Wendy is, that I've learned uh, vicariously through Wendy about uh, when someone's giving off signals and hints that the number one response of other people is silence. It's changing the subject. It's just nothing. That's the number one most common response when someone tells someone else that they're suicidal. And all that communicates is, I don't matter. They don't care. And so, you know, QPR, you know, just being able to ask the question is breaking through one of the biggest barriers right from the beginning is get into the conversation with the person who's struggling. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I'll repeat that just so they can hear it. Uh, so do you have some examples of some uh, breakthrough stories, people that have practiced QPR training or something similar and actually had seen, um, for lack of a better word, success? Um, the difficult thing about suicide prevention is it's not quantitative. So it's kind of a depressing work because sometimes you know of successes, but so often you don't, you don't know, but you know the ones you lose. It's so hard to know the ones you lose. Like I can picture the face, I know the names of the ones I was working with that I lost. As far as successes, um, we did this training in Utah in July to a Mormon LGBT conference. Um, we did two back-to-back -back trainings, and before we had even finished the day out, we got messages that the QPR training, that the people there had learned, that one person had two people had implemented it, and one life was saved. And that was the same day. And I just, I remember hearing that and just breaking down and like crying in my husband's shoulder thinking, Yes, there was one. There was one, because so often you don't know. But it's like that rock that you like throw in the pond and the ripples that go out. Everybody that knows what it looks like to recognize suicidal ideation, to ask the question, to intervene, to get help, the more people that know that, the more people are safe. So I don't have like, I mean, I can tell like a couple specific stories of like, yes, I intervened and I saved a life, but that it's more important that other people have the knowledge and the tools so that that it, so it goes outside of just me or outside of anyone that's just trained one of the thing that that's interesting and we talked about this a little bit before is we we highlight probably because of the world we live in how this affects the lgbtq community and i know that's because it's your story mm -hmm. and that makes sense that makes sense we operate from the story or lens we're given same with myself. Any brush with suicide ideation I've had has been because of my own struggle. Um, but one thing I found actually mind-blowing and fascinating was that in reading statistics that suicide, the suicide rate was highest in middle-aged white males. Mm -hmm. Highest That's in middle-aged white males in particular. We talked a little bit about, about maybe why. Mm -hmm. But actually, since Tom is up here. <laughs> <laughs> Middle-aged straight white male, exhibit we, A. <laughs> we had thoughts and ideas, maybe why, but I do think it would be great to hear that perspective. Why do you think that is, Tom? Um, fragile ego, maybe? I don't know. Um, he said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> um... I don't, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I could answer for people in that space. Uh, it's certainly not something I have personal experience with feeling. Uh, I can only think that there's a lot of uh, responsibility. So if you feel like you have a tremendous level of responsibility and then you fail at it and you have family and people who are disappointed or lost a, lo a lot of a lot of the suicidal ideation comes out of loss um, 
which I, I was actually thinking of all the places that this conversation should be in is in a church um, because you know when your purpose is to give hope um, and to help people in crisis not necessarily that it's a suicidal crisis but in any form of crisis uh, I mean that's uh, the message of Christ is being able to reach down and empathize and feel and be with you in that crisis. Um, and you know, the other thing I would say just about uh, the white male statistic is um, you feel like you have to go it alone in a lot of ways, so you isolate yourself. Um, and you know, the other thing I've heard is because uh, the Male statistic of successful completion of suicide is much higher, generally because they use more violent methods. You, you, I'm hearing a couple of things echoed in some of these statements that what we're talking about is shame, and we're talking about not being able to talk about something. And so we, we all know how this goes. When you don't talk about something, um, and you kind of bury it, it, you actually give it more power, a lot more power, than if you just say, hey, here, here's what I'm wrestling with. And so I think that's why we see it a lot in the LGBTQ community, is because they feel deep shame, they can't talk about who they are, so the only option seems like suicide. A veteran struggling with PTSD, they're taught to be a certain way, can't talk about it. And so they think that's the only option. And this is why we lean into the difficult conversations, is because by talking about it, even though it's uncomfortable, it, it really uh, sheds some light to it, and it's not as scary. And you go, you know what? A, I'm not alone. There's other people in this room that have felt this way or thought this way or experienced this. Um, but B, just by asking a question. That's what I was amazed. Just by asking a simple question, you can instantly decrease that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I have one other question, and we'll, we'll wrap this up for the night. Um, one thing I don't know that we talked about uh, is I do understand there's maybe more of a case-by-case -case suicide ideation. First of all, we keep saying suicide ideation, and I don't know that everyone knows what that terminology means. So let's start there. Let's define that real quick. It's pretty much suicidal thoughts, but ideation maybe goes a little bit more. It's, it's just the perpetual narrative in your head where you're thinking suicide is my best option. That's suicidal ideation. And while we're speaking to terms, um, it's considered better political, politically correct form to say died by suicide um, rather than committed suicide. Because committed makes it that there's this stigma of like committed a crime or you did something wrong rather than it's, it's better to just say we lost them to suicide or they died by suicide. Mm. So I'll just throw that out there too, that that feels kinder to people that have lost others to suicide. Yeah, that brings a whole, we, we probably don't have time for that, but that brings another interesting thing is the people that have been left mm -hmm. by those that have been lost to suicide, how they are perceived um, mm -hmm. in the world. And so that's good. That's good to be mindful of our language, words we should say and shouldn't say. Um, we, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but what I, was, what I was about to say is that there's different cases where someone might be in this moment of you're dealing with something loss, like you said, loss or grief, and you have this moment of suicide ideation versus maybe someone that suffers with um, a, a mental illness or a different diagnosis and they have more perpetual ongoing depression and mm -hmm. suicide, and there is definitely a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and I know this from talking to certain family members that I have where I have had a moment of a suicide attempt, and that's in my rear view, uh, because those situations have changed, versus for them it's an ongoing choosing to stay. Mm -hmm. So with that, how do you think, uh, do you think that the risk of suicide is inherited? Yes and no. Um, in over 90% of suicide attempts and completed suicide, depression was a factor. Depression is considered the common cold of mental illness because it's just ubiquitous, it's everywhere. 
it is also the most undertreated um, mental illness slash disease out there, and it's also the most easily treated. Once you are getting it, but it's so undertreated that depression becomes suicidal ideation. But when people are under a doctor's care, whether they need um, talk therapy, whether they need med therapy, there's a, all sorts of different options. But if depression is ongoing and chronic and untreated, that's a big red flag. And also, real quick, what was the other... Um, we, we talked about how uh, middle-aged white males are actually among the largest. What was the, the second largest? Seniors. Senior citizens. How, how old and up, would you say? 60 and up is 60. the statistic that the um, AFSP uses, which is the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And the reason that they give that, su that seniors are at higher risk is they could have lost a spouse recently, um, that puts them at higher risk. They could have gotten a um, terminal illness diagnosis, and they don't want to be in pain. Um, and it's not just that seniors are more suicidal than other people. It's that they've lived long enough that they know how to get the job done if they're going that direction, very much like veterans. Like they're, They know that they're not going to call anybody for help. Sometimes they live alone. Um, so there's nobody there to see and witness that to help them. So they're, they're a really high demographic of suicidality as well. Okay. So we get a sense that suicide really affects anybody. Mm -hmm. It's no respecter of persons, right? So we're not mm -hmm. just, it's not just LGBTQ. We're mm -hmm. talking straight, gay, white, black, every race in between. And it's affecting everyone, which is why we're talking about it. Um, with that being said, the training, um, it's not on the slide, but it's going to be before the service and it's going to be in the mission hall. So we'll have it, it's just a, a, about an hour long training. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned um, the book, there was only a cost for the booklets, correct? Mm -hmm. And that's $3. $3. So if you can spare $3, or if you can't, but someone else can, $3 for the booklet. That's all that's being charged. It's just for the printing materials. And you'll walk away having training to recognize and, and be able to understand uh, maybe what you can do to try to save someone's life, which is really important. Can we thank them both for tonight, for being here? <laughs> you know, let's take a, a moment to know that if, you're, that if you're here, you may feel maybe lonely and isolated in other areas of your life, but in this place, in this time now, you are loved. And it's cliche of, of churches to approach suicide with saying, well, God loves you. And that is true. And we're going to reflect on God's love in this next song. But may you also know that there's real flesh and blood humans in this place as well that love you. And that we are here for you, to support you, to walk alongside you. And that is what I believe the job of a church should be is some call it a hospital, some call it a place of hope, and it should be a place that we can worship and rejoice together, but also help those in need. And so if you're one of those people tonight, I hope that you feel seen in some way, shape, or form, um, and know that you're loved, know that you're loved by the divine, and know that you're loved by us in this place.